I'd like to welcome you to the uh, to the last in the winter series of uh, guest lectures for the college. However, we do have a special uh, lecture coming up uh, up next Monday night, sponsored by the uh, Department of Architecture. It'll be announced uh, during the uh, during this coming week. We're very happy to have Joe Tremor, Professor Joe Tremor, speaking tonight. He is a professor of English here at the university. He's one of a small group of uh, young uh, faculty on campus who've been very interested in interdisciplinary work, especially revolving uh, first around, uh, around Muncie as Middletown. He was involved in the first project he was not involved in the project on working in Middletown. He's now involved as a writer for the six one-hour-long films that are being made uh, on Muncie uh, as Middletown, or life in Middletown. He holds a Bachelor of Degree uh, in English, or in Literature, from Colgate University, and a Master's and a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Purdue University. He is the author of numerous books and articles on American life and literature. The thing we are to hear about tonight is senses of place. He's been very interested in a sense of place in terms of literature, and uh, we're very interested that he uh, could see the connections between the way that a uh, a writer thinks of sense of place in the way that architects, landscape architects, and landscape architects and planners think about a sense of place. And it was that uh, that interest that led him to apply for a Lilly grant. And he spent last year as a Lilly uh, fellow studying the senses of place. Joe Tremor. Thank you, folks. As uh, Dean Sapperfield pointed out, I'm out of place tonight. This is uh, not my place. I'm a visitor to your place. My normal place is in the English department, <clears throat> where I teach what my students call stories. They lump all of literature under that label, poems, plays, novels, essays. All of these things are stories. So I teach stories. Stories uh, take place some place. They are set in a scene. And for the last few years, I've been very interested in how places generate, define, and color stories. And as Dean Sappenfield mentioned, the Lily people were kind enough. I think they sold a lot of Darvon that year or something. They were kind enough to fund me for a year to study place, and I studied that at your place, at the College of Architecture and Planning, and also at several other places throughout the United States. I present my results to you tonight not as scholarly research, but as entertaining stories. Stories about specific people, specific places, and the profound feelings that, that bind them together. And I'd like to begin in, at my place tonight, that is, before I venture into the, the, the whole notion of physical place, I'd like to begin with some literary statements of place. I'd like to read three brief excerpts. One from the West, one about the North and the South, and one about the Midwest. The first is by N. Scott Mamaday, an American Indian writer. His passage tells us about how places generate stories. A dark mist lay over the Black Hills, and the land was like iron. At the top of the ridge, I caught sight of Devil's Tower, up thrust against the gray sky, as if in the birth of time, the core of the earth had broken through its crust, and the motion of the world was begun. There are things in nature that engender an awful quiet in the heart of man. Devil's Tower is one of them. 
Two centuries ago, because they could not do otherwise, the Kiowa Indians made a legend at the base of the rock. My grandmother told it to me. Eight children were at play, seven sisters and their brother. Suddenly, the boy was struck dumb. He trembled and began to run upon his hands and feet. His fingers became claws and his body was covered with fur. Directly, there was a bear where the boy had been. The sisters were terrified. They ran and the bear after them. They came to a stump of a great tree and the tree spoke to them. It bade them climb upon it. And as they did so, it began to rise into the air. The bear came to kill them, but they were just beyond its reach. It reared against the tree and scored the bark all around with its claws. The seven sisters were born into the sky and they became the stars of the Big Dipper. From that moment, and so long as the story lives, the Kiowas have kinsmen in the night sky. The second story is about the North and the South. The speaker is a Northerner, and he's trying to understand the South. From William Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. Wait a minute. Listen. I'm not trying to be funny, smart. I just want to understand if I can, and I don't know how to say it better because it's something my people haven't got. Or if we got it, it all happened long ago across the water, and so now there ain't anything to look at every day to remind us of it. We don't live among defeated grandfathers and freed slaves and bullets in the dining room table and such to be always reminding us to never forget. What is it? Something you live and breathe in like air? A kind of vacuum filled with wraith-like and indomitable anger and pride and glory at and in happenings that occurred and ceased 50 years ago, a kind of entailed birthright, father and son and father and son of never forgiving General Sherman, so that forevermore, as long as your children's children produce children, you won't be anything but a descendant of a long line of colonels killed at Pickett's charge that Manassas? Gettysburg, Quinn said. You can't understand it. You would have to have been born there, the South. And finally, our place. The Midwest, William Gass, in the heart of the heart of the country. We're always out of luck here. That's just how it is. For instance, in the winter, the sides of the buildings, the roofs, the limbs of the tree are gray. Streets, sidewalks, faces, feelings, they are gray. Speech is gray, and the grass where it shows. Every flank and front, each top is gray. Everything is gray. Hairs, eyes, windows, glass, the hawkers' bills, the touters' posters, lips, teeth, poles, and metal signs. They're gray, quite gray. Cars are gray. Boots, shoes, suits, hats, gloves are gray. Horses, sheep, cows, cats killed in the road, squirrels the same way. Sparrows, doves, and pigeons are all gray. Everything is gray, and everyone is out of luck who lives here. A similar haze turns the summer sky milky, and the air muffles your head and shoulders like a sweater you've got caught in. The summer light, too, the sky darkens a moment when you open your eyes. The heat is pure distraction. Steeped in our fluids, miserable in the folds of our body, we can scarcely think of anything but our sticky parts. In 1833, an itinerant preacher with a name like a fairy tale summed up the situation in one Indiana town this way. Ignorance and her squalid brood, a universal dearth of intellect, total abstinence from literature is generally practiced. There is not a scholar in grammar or geography or a teacher capable of instructing in them, to my knowledge. Others are supplied a few months of the year with the most antiquated and unreasonable forms of teaching, reading, writing, and ciphering. Need I stop to remind you of the host of loathsome reptiles such a stagnant pool is fit to breed? Croaking jealousy, bloated bigotry, coiling suspicion, wormish blindness, crocodile malice. Things have changed since then, but in none of the respects mentioned. Okay, okay. Three such different stories about place suggest the need for some kind of explanation, some theory or theories that will help us see how we sense a place. There are many such theories, and writers such as Kevin Lynch and Brink Jackson and Yibu Tuan have written eloquently about the psychology of environmental awareness but they all seem to agree on two points, that we sense places at two levels. The first level 
is private. The self is at the center of this place, and landmarks, events, and people decrease in meaning the further they are located away from that center. And ringed by the orbits of house and yard and neighborhood, the self senses place through a series of very private daily rituals. The second level is public. While the first level is a thick texture of specific details, the second level is a vague shape, an outline, that locates our identity in some kind of hierarchy. We are citizens whose lives are given meaning by geographical abstractions such as city and state and nation. Names, signs, skylines, symbols conjure another set of feelings that relate to collective public myths. I would like to look at those two senses of place, then, um, by talking some about the patterns of place. When you came in, you should have received or picked up off the table an outline. Uh, that's for a couple of purposes. It was for me, so I knew where I was going. It's for you, in case you doze off. You'll have a record that you were here. Um, but it also gives us something to talk about. Let's begin with the most private. And I'd like to try an experiment. I want you to think about a place, a specific place, a specific house that you lived in somewhere in the period of 9 to 13, 10 if it's a convenient age. I want you to think very specifically about that house. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you to, to close your eyes and to try to reconstruct in your memory that place. And I want you to think almost as if you are a camera, a motion picture camera. And I will attempt to be a kind of director, suggesting things that you might want to think about and remember. That word is an interesting one, remember. Remember to put back together the pieces, the members. Um, my voice may intrude upon your remembering. If so, just forget about it and think about what you want to think about. Um, but I'd like you to close your eyes now and think about that place, that specific place when you were 10. We're going to go through that place first with the five senses. And since man is primarily a visual animal, we'll start with sight. Think about the form, the line, the color, the scale in that landscape. Try to remember exactly where everything is placed, where the living room is, where the kitchen is, where your room is, where your bed is, anything else in the room that is memorable to you, what you see outside the window from that room. As you go out the house, think about the things that are in the sky. What does dominate the skyline? Trees? telephone wires, church steeples, courthouses. Think about the sights of that place. Think about the things that you can touch. Man's sense of balance really is communicated through his touch. We talk about keeping in touch, being out of touch. You are in touch right now. You feel the pressure of the world in a very real sense at the back of your chair pinch of your shoes. So think about the textures in your house. Think about the floors, the rugs, the hard floors, linoleum floors, which floor you played on, which was the best floor for toys. Think about the outside surfaces, the sidewalks, the cracks in the sidewalk, the way the cracks organized games for you, perhaps, rough surfaces. Think about the lawn, the lawn you had to mow, the sidewalk you had to shovel. There are patterns in that lawn that you put on that lawn with your lawnmower back and forth or around and around, however you did it, indelibly impressed on that place. Think about other things that you could feel in your house, certain tools that your father owned, your own blanket when you went to sleep at night, a myriad of textures all around you. Think about the sounds of your house. Sound is probably the most important of our senses. 
Without it, we have a sense of depression and disassociation. We need sound. We need a soundtrack running in our mind all the time, a kind of harmony with the world. So think about the sounds perhaps inside your house first. The furnace, the sink, the shower, the toilet, the TV, clocks. Think about the natural sounds that you can hear inside the house that come from outside the house. Rain, animals in the eaves, birds. Think about the street sounds. Kids, lawnmowers, cars, the sound of cars starting or not starting in the morning. And voices, specific voices. Parents, brothers or sisters, grandparents, maybe just the sound of pronouncing the name, your name, your street's name, your friend's name, will call back a whole set of memories. Smell. Smell probably is the most important way to remember something. Smell was once very close to the brain, concerned with memory, that whole sense of being close to sensing the world with our nose, evolutionarily, probably, back to animals. Uh, perhaps as a child, because your nose was closer to the ground, you smelled things better. Spring, garbage. Think about the smells of your yard, your basement, your barn, the kitchen, your closet. Smells of specific people, your father's aftershave or your mother's perfume, or specific processes like your father's pipe smoking or the coffee perking or the laundry washing or the leaves burning in the backyard. And finally, taste, our most direct contact with the world. We sample, sample, chew, digest, empower ourselves through our food. We are literally what we eat. And everything has subtle textures of taste and associations and symbols. So think about your tastes in your house, your food, the regulars, what was on Tuesday night, what was on Friday night, your favorites, the one that were prepared especially on birthdays, the fetishes like devil dogs or jawbreakers, whatever you hid, the ceremonies like Christmas and Thanksgiving, and the whole process of preparing it and sampling it and storing it and hoarding it and finding it and the schedule for eating it, the etiquette for eating it. And then think about other tastes, new tastes, new textures, down the street where they didn't have what you had. Strange foods, ethnic foods, strange smells. So when you put sight, sound, smell, touch, taste together in that house at 10, you should have a web of complex emotional associations that are pretty hard to get at, except that you can identify specific pictures, specific associations. Okay, that's all for the meditation. But just some sense of that, how deeply into that house you might have been able to, to put yourself gives you some sense of what that place was, that sense of place, just at a sensual level. And of course, there are other ways to sense and organize a place. Basic seasonal patterns, day. What is the place like in the morning? What's the place like it during the day? What's the place like at night? Certain places in the, during the day, certain rituals like shelter and sleep and grooming and feeding that are organized by certain patterns. The week is organized by certain patterns, where you play, where you go to school, where you go to work, where you go to church. And of course, the year. The place does not change. The place is not the same from week to week and day to day and month to month. The season, the weather, the holidays, everything changes so that sunlight and clouds and rain and snow and vacations and holidays all alter the way the constant scene. It's almost as if your place is a theater and you've changed the lighting or you've changed the scenery and now it's suddenly a new place. Let's get some more public ways to organize place though. Let's think <clears throat> about life. <laughs> life. Um, 
Shakespeare says that there are seven ages of man. Eric Erickson says there are eight ages. Gail Sheehy says we've got passages around every corner. Um, but each one of these stages, each one of these stages in our life is acted out upon a stage, a physical stage. Now, each of these stages gets larger and larger as we go through life, but each one of them has its own kind of unique physical confines and physical characteristics. Let's just take the eight stages that Erickson mentions, for example. Stage one, infant. The stage is the crib and the room. Stage two, early childhood. The stage is the house and the yard. Stage three, the play age. The stage is the block. Stage four, the school age. The stage is the neighborhood. Stage five, adolescence. Really the whole community, particularly because of the car. Young adulthood, a new stage, away from home or at least living in a different place. And adulthood, the larger world of work. And as we'll see later, that might be a larger or maybe, unfortunately, a smaller stage, depending on what place or what sense of place the person has. And finally, as we get older, that sense of place restricts itself. Rooms, front porches, and the box. OK. Um, there are also intellectual ways to organize space, as we all know. Uh, Charles mentioned that I've been working on the Middletown project. The Lens, when they came to Muncie in the 1920s, were working under what they thought was a, a new form of, of cultural anthropology. That is, Margaret Mead had gone to Samoa and had studied primitive cultures and had organized and preserved those cultures and organized those cultures in terms of what she called basic trunk activities, main activities that all people do. And the Lens tried to do the same thing here in Muncie, only using, of course, of contemporary society. There are six categories. The six categories for our films, by the way, are work, family, education, leisure, government, and worship. And those six each have, of course, their stage. Work has factory or office. Family has home. Education has school. Leisure has the park, the gym, or the lake. Government has courthouse. Worship. Uh, religion has the church. As I've been indicating, um, I've been working on place for a couple of years now, and I've been co composing a book about it. And I've been trying to determine how people perceive the places that they live in and how they see their places in relation to other places and how they communicate these perceptions in their behavior and their belief. And it's a very difficult thing to get at. But I have discovered that people often view their autobiographies as elaborate atlases, maps, of where they have been and what they are and where they would like to go. Indeed, the definitions people create or assume for themselves are always embedded in the names of specific places. Open your wallet. I am from Muncie, Indiana. I am a Hoosier. I am a Bearcat. I am something which defines who you are, some place name. Such places not only locate people in an immediate physical world, but also connect them to an ultimate universal scheme. All of us, I think, understand the pattern of place addressed on the little envelope that was received by the sick girl in Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town. Jane Crowfoot, the Crowfoot Farm, Grover's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, United States of America, continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the Solar System, the Universe, and the mind of God. As Tuan says, a place is a center of meaning constructed by experience. Now, the location need not be spectacularly beautiful or historically important to be meaningful. A drab, gray, flat, smaller-than-life town like Muncie would, would serve to be a meaningful place. Actually, monumental spaces are often really so layered over with public significance that they fail to inspire a sense of place. A true place is a private affair a special and an abiding relationship between one person and one landscape. And because the self, you, discover and define this place, things diminish in importance and in value and meaning the more distantly they are located from that center. Now, increased activity and awareness often expand the circumference of our worlds, but creating galaxies which operate by their own laws and which are inhabited by their own gods. But the gravitational pull remains at the center, located in that one specific place. 
It is holy ground, our heartland. We call it home. All of us have lived in such a place. We speak of it in reverent tones and assume its superiority to all other places and defend its honor against the insults and the indifference of other people. But these feelings are not acquired in passing. They are the result of long residence and deep involvement. A place takes time. A place takes pain. Indeed, we often associate a place with significant periods in our lives, a stage in our personal development, as I said, a stage where we acted out some major passage in our childhood, adolescence, or adulthood. Now, in my own research, I focused on four ages. I'm going to be showing you some of this in a minute in the slides. But the four ages are 10, 18, 35, and 55. And each age presents its own pattern with regard to place. At 10, children view their neighborhood as a kind of private kingdom, a terrain organized by games, shortcuts, hideouts. But gradually, children are lured outside the protective boundaries of this kingdom by school, extracurricular activities, and the independent mobility of the bike. At 18, adolescents rule a turf defined by dating patterns and the car. This rule is short-lived because it attempts an impossible compromise between the impulse to leave home to assert independence and discover romance and the impulse to stay put, to hold on perhaps too long to childhood, play, and sanctuary. At 35, people are also very ambivalent about place. They have bought a home, established a family, and earned some recognition through their work but they are haunted by a vague sense of disappointment and even displacement. They still want to go places. Yet paradoxically, many middle-aged people spend a good deal of time backtracking, daydreaming about better times and better places. At 55, people relax. Old friends and old places assume a new resonance, and there's a new contentment, a new mellowing as people understand accept and even savor their place. It is time to be at home in the world. Now, this little schema I've set up here for the four ages may suggest that place is a pretty simple topic to get at. Actually, the subject is pretty difficult to locate. The larger cultural patterns, the shared conditions of age and region, what it means to be 19 in the South, are, are available to the writer, but the smaller individual patterns seem inaccessible. Often, as maybe that meditation suggested to you, the environments are so entangled in emotional experiences that people cannot understand, much less describe their sense of a place. So for my purposes as a writer trying to get at this, uh, I needed a new way to sense the places where people lived, a new process by which I could see the creative shaping of a physical space into some kind of psychological place. I needed what I have called a place map. A place map is a sort of geographical Rorschach sketch. Um, it is drawn on a large easel with an ample supply of colored pens at the prompting of an interviewer. The subject is asked to map significant places in his life and to talk about the events that took place on that sacred ground. The process is really quite a long one, uh, sometimes taking four hours for one session. And the map maker, like the writer or the, the interviewer is initially intimidated by the blank page which he's asked to map. But once the overall design is fixed, the sketch pad seems to function like a Ouija board. A simple mark provokes one memory after another until the play of pen and mind create a world of color, lines, figures, signs, rivers, roads, neighborhoods, each with its own plot, theme, and cast of characters. The scene has created a story. And once he completes his drawing, the map maker pauses to contemplate the world he has created and which created him. And as he surveys the meaningful symbols in his composition, a revelation is at hand. He has mapped the ground of his being. For the last 10 years, uh, last year I've been, it seems like 10, I've been collecting place maps from people all across the United States, all incomes, all ages, all environments. 
Each mapping session, about 65 of them to date, have been longer and more entertaining and really more informative than either the subject or the interviewer really thought as we began. And I selected those people to be interviewed by a, a fairly simple process. You have a questionnaire in your material. You might want to look at that for a second. Um, as you read through it, you should notice uh, a kind of grouping of information. And of course, questionnaires only give you a kind of rough sampling. If you're going to a one high school in, pardon me, one grade school in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you, you have given questionnaires to 400 kids and you try to figure out the five or six that you want to interview in the three days that you've assigned yourself to that particular town, it's kind of hard to go from the 300 to the five or six uh, and make good choices. People sometimes are better than their questionnaires and sometimes they are worse than their questionnaires. The questionnaires look wonderful and then you start talking to them and that's all they have to say. There's nothing else. Um, but the four sections deal with certain subjects that I was interested in. Number one, page one, as you can tell by the questions, um, deal with the question of rootedness. The degree to which a potential subject family has had long association in one place. I'm interest, interested really in all people in this category, those who are rooted and those who are rootless. As you'll see in, in a couple of the slides, there was one family in which the girl moved eight times in nine years. Section two deals with, or page two, deals with intimacy. The degree to which a particular subject is very sensitive or aware to the private and personal space in his world. So there are questions about bedroom and, and favorite places to read and what you see out the window and, and, and so forth. Section three deals with mobility. Uh, the degree to which a subject has traveled and experienced other places and, and really the way in which he's traveled and experienced other places, trains or planes, um, horses. Uh, it's remarkable how limited the mobility of some of the kids I interviewed really was. They had never been in anything other than a car and there only to drive around in the town in which they lived. And the last section deals with values. The degree to which a subject evaluates the places he knows and is aware of alternatives. There, the one problem in my questionnaire that gave most school boards and most teachers and most parents the most difficulty were those two questions about rich kids and poor kids. And the question was, where do rich kids live and where do the poor kids live? And of course, the parents would always say, we have taught our children not to make distinctions between rich and poor. They don't know where the rich people live and the poor people live. Well, that's not quite true. We know that. And, and the symbols for rich and poor in place are pretty evident. And uh, in a minute, I'll get to a pretty dramatic little story about how that was revealed to me in one of the interviews. OK, those are the questionnaires. and. Um, I'd like to begin the slides tonight, if I could have the lights, with looking at uh, simply the problem of uh, how you see something. The first 10 or 15 slides deal with the problem of physical position in the landscape, what we see and how we see it, and also the psychological attitude we have toward the landscape. I've put some paintings in to indicate different moods that reflect uh, the landscape. Okay, here's position in the landscape. Um, further away. Now, this is a very famous cartoon from a New Yorker. And this gives us some sense of where we stand in the landscape. If you're standing on Ninth Avenue in the middle of uh, Manhattan, your view of the world uh, is interesting. The Hudson River is in the middle of your world. Jersey is a small line. Dimly, you can see Vegas, Utah, and Los Angeles, the ocean, and Japan way over there. Chicago. Chicago we see here, I presume that Muncie is somewhere between Jersey and the Rocky Mountains. Okay, but there are many of us who uh, grew up in New York and do, do not share the, the view of Midtown, so I'd like to reverse it a little bit and see New York from uh, Westchester County in which you can see the island of Manhattan dimly visible down here at the extreme edge of the universe and uh, there are other parts of the world that are, are more central. Okay, as to mood. Most of our landscapes that we see in paintings do not have people in them. Many of them are tranquil, uh, even idealistic, certainly um, pictorial in terms of panorama. People are comfortable in this world, at home in it, literally at peace in the natural surroundings. Now something happened to that landscape quite quickly when first uh, horses, and uh, then cars, and more cars, and roads, 
and more roads began to intrude factories, cities, signs, and more signs. And the result was that uh, that tranquil, beatific little world where the, the boy was on his back looking at the, at the sky became something quite different. And we have images of destruction from, from water, from fire, images of destruction of another kind, of another kind, and the junk which our, our cars created, piles of junk, and people and animals and bombs. Well, those are the moods that can be engendered by different kinds of landscapes. Let's look at some specific physical places. Let's begin with our place, Middletown. This is a map that was in the original Middletown study, and you notice that they have conveniently divided the city into two basic areas, business class and working class, uh, blacks here and here. This is a neighborhood called Whiteley. Uh, our first map is from this neighborhood here in a project area known as Munciana. Keith, who lives in this, in this particular area, sees the older parts of Muncie. Uh, it's a kind of bleak world for him. He may not see this particular part of Muncie. This is the old courthouse, of course. But he does see vacant lots, parking lots, water tower, more vacant lots. When the film crew was out here from New York, they thought all of Muncie was a vacant lot. Uh, and bus stops. And this is Keith's map. Keith's world um, is fairly organized by two institutions, church and school. Um, he goes out of his, his project home to go to school, and he goes to church. He lives with his grandmother and his younger brother, and, the only visible sign of his parents is the picture on, of his mother on the television set. His father is unknown. Uh, as I said, his world is dominated by church and school. His grandmother takes him to church three times a week, helps him memorize his Bible, and encourages him to sing in the church choir. He knows quite a bit of the Bible. And when I ask him where he, in that, word, that question about where you would like to live, he pulled out the Bible and read me a description of heaven. Um, School consumes most of his weekly hours, but despite his good intentions, he's not doing very well. He thought this mapping project would give him some extra credit. Uh, 306 East 2nd Street is a very solemn three-room apartment, and there's very little light inside, uh, except for the glare of the television set and the windows, which are covered. But you notice that Keith has not drawn windows in his house. He sees it as a, literally a fortress. Uh, the neighborhood's outside activity is pretty bad, even during the daytime. Keith has seen several stabbings and robberies, most of which emanated from Bob's Tavern down the way, where Keith says a lot of bad stuff goes on. Uh, when he grows up, he wants to live somewhere very far away. Bob does not live in the middle of the of town. He lives out in the suburbs where they've scraped off all the topsoil and turned it into a marvelous, marvelous suburb track with a regular garbage pickup, nice lawn. And this is Bob's map. Notice it's an outside map. The house is barely visible here. Bob is 10, he lives with his parents in a suburb, and although he has no brothers and sisters, he has a strong sense of family because two sets of grandparents are within an hour's drive, and many of his relatives come to visit him. His world is comfortable and secure, and by contrast to Keith, much more innocent. He travels at will throughout his neighborhood on his bike. I ride my bike on the street. I play two square in the driveway, child's game. Um, he rides his bike at will throughout the neighborhood, never seeing anything that would upset his vision of a stable environment. He is not sure he knows where he wants to live when he grows up. Muncie's just fine, he says. Um, but he would also like to live where his favorite cousin lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, or where his favorite football team plays in Dallas. But notice um, the names of people, Mr. Stevenson's house. I talked to Mr. John when he washes his car. 
The whole neighborhood is his terrain. It's his turf. It is something very much, um, a very fluid world. It's, it's indicated really by the color. Um, let's take two other slides. These two also from two social extremes living in um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Both of these people, Jeff, this is Jeff's map, and Vanessa I'll show you in a minute. Both Jeff and Vanessa attend uh, the First Ward School in downtown Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. I went to Charlotte because Charlotte was a very famous city for um, changing the, the busing pattern, and I wanted to see how that, that altered the kids' perception of the place. Jeff lives in a white suburb, and like 30 of his 35 schoolmates, he must travel over one hour on the bus to go to school every day. He wants to be a veterinarian, which explains uh, cats and so forth here. He knows all the names of all the animals in his neighborhood. His parents, uh, particularly his father, a local merchant, encourage him to participate in many local activities. His afternoons are consumed by when he gets home, finally, uh, by the YMCA and church. And backyard games, like most of us, I think, uh, organizing the whole backyard in terms of bases for kickball or um, using the fence for a uh, to indicate the, the parameters of some kind of game. Now, I want to show you the, the, the next map because there's something comparable in this. Uh, this is Vanessa's map. Vanessa lives in the project, which is two blocks from Ward 1 School. She's one of the five kids who actually walk to school every day in her class. The other 30, as I said, were bust. She wants to be a nurse, and for that reason, she likes to draw pictures of herself in a white uniform. But whereas, um, whereas Jeff spends most of his afternoon going to the YMCA in the church, Vanessa's world is really organized by these institutions. She gets up in the morning and goes to school. Um, I guess that's not school. It's Midget Market. Pardon me. She goes to, this is her way to school, where she is given breakfast. She also gets lunch at the school. And then when she comes home from school, she goes to this church where she does her homework and takes a nap until 6 o'clock when her mother gets home from the hospital, her mother's pent up. Um, Pretty bleak world. I had to ask her to draw windows in her house, too. She didn't um, have windows in before I mentioned it to her. Now, I say it's a pretty bleak world, but it's a pretty bleak world for me, a white suburban uh, middle class uh, honky. Um, but it, was particularly, uh, it wasn't a particularly intimidating world for her. Um, for example, I, she said she wanted to go to the market, so I walked with her over to Midget Market. This is a very scary place. There were bars on the windows and everything, and the only sign that indicated that it was a market was a little sign that said, we take food stamps. And there were six guys outside drinking out of paper bags. And I thought, you know, my life was gone. But they all said, hi, Vanessa. And she said, hi. And it was, a, it was a very pleasant experience. We sat around talking all afternoon in the parking lot. Now, just as, just as um, Jeff organizes his backyard, that is, the thing that I'm beginning to conclude about all kids is they, their imagination works on the, whatever terrain they have, and they convert it into whatever they want it to be. These two things here. That, that look like the ends of a Tootsie Roll are actually um, traffic bumps to cut down the, the travel in the, in the project, right? So you don't go more than about 15 miles an hour. But she converts it into a game called Bump to Bump, in which they run back and forth as fast as they can, just like Jeff converts his backyard into a, into a baseball diamond. OK. Uh, just to compare again with uh, Keith's slide, there are some similarities. Notice the, the, uh, the house and the car. OK, um, we moved to Boston for Stacy. Um, she's very aware of, of the historical tradition in Boston. She's, she knows that it's near. I mean, she's, she's aware of water, uh, of the skyline, of green, and, and of old buildings, and parks, the commons. But she lives in a, in a suburb of Boston called Sherburn, which is out near Wellesley. In a fine old house, and this is Stacy's map. Um, some interesting things in Stacy's map. Stacy's eight years old and lives, as I said, in an older suburban development. Her father is an attorney, and her mother is active in social affairs. And Stacy's world is colorful and fluid and comfortable. She plays in the woods near her house with her friends, some of whom come to see their other parents only on weekends. Notice that this little thing here, the, a sign of the times, um, coming to visit their other parents on weekends. Uh, Right here. Um, <clears throat> she spends her spring vacations in Florida visiting her grandmother and goes to private camp every summer. And although everyone owns two cars in her neighborhood, notice the, 
dads and moms and misters and misses on the garage there. Uh, she takes the bus to school every day. When she grows up, she wants to live in a house just like her parents. The detail here is interesting. Crab apple, the, uh, the flowers in the window box, the living room, uh, the eagle here, the brass knocker here. And I asked her why she drew the colors that she drew on the windows. And she said the colors on the windows corresponded to the color inside the, that the room was painted. Okay, by contrast to that world, look at Heather. Heather lives in Atlanta. She also has a, a skyline, a, a sense of history, a, an active, growing city. But Heather's world and Stacy's world are as far as apart as you can get. Heather is 10 years old and lives with her mother and stepfather in a new suburb in Atlanta. All the houses look like a neo-funeral home, I guess you'd call it in style. Um, her father, who now owns 15 nursing homes, used to be president of a real estate company when he lived with his first wife and children in Roanoke. Heather's mother is much, much younger than her father. Her family has moved a good deal, six times, I was wrong, six times in eight years. Heather's house is a very small part of her map. Um, you could read this two ways, I suppose. You could read that she, she's outside a lot, but my conversations with her indicated that she wasn't outside very much at all. But she doesn't really know her own house very well. She's been in so many of them over the years. And she, she's not even there very much. All of her friends go to private school, and she attends a different private school on the other side of town. And nobody in her neighborhood, this whole neighborhood, goes to the public school, which is two blocks this way. Um, Heather does not want to move. She dislikes new schools and is most afraid. Remember that one question, what are you most, what are the place you're scared of? She wrote, the reason I interviewed her was because she said she was afraid of being kidnapped. Uh, a sense, a real sense of insecurity. When she wants to grow up, she wants to live, for some reason, in Switzerland. Um, safe, secure, neutral, I guess, is the way we look at it. Now, I want to pair two extremes. I want to pair a rural and an a urban map. And we begin with Jay, uh, who lives on a farm in Iowa. And we have images of, that's not Jay. Uh, we have a certain image of the farmer in our, in our mythology uh, that relates to a, a, a pastoral environment, uh, or at least a, an agricultural environment, with, which, you know, out of cure your knives, that is both beautiful uh, tranquil, the homestead forms a major part of that whole mythology. As I said, tranquil. Um, the family, close to the land, close to God, the generations together, many of them together. And the work, the animals and the crops and families and animals working the land. As I said, it's sum summarized, perhaps, in that painting. God, nature, a beatific, beautiful world. But there are bad parts to this world, too, that Jay may not see. The loneliness, the natural disasters, the erosion, the drought. But this is Jay's map. Jay is nine years old and lives with his parents on a farm in Iowa. And his world is organized by his chores and the weather and the seasons. His world is also dominated by family. Fifty-one of his relatives live within a 30-mile radius of his house. His grandmother and cousin's house are significant maps. Uh, see, where are, here we go. Way to grandma's, way mom goes to work, and I think way to my cousin's house here, over here. Um, he says when he grows up, he wants to live on the farm because I know everybody here. But just the way the crops organize his world. We have corn here, and sometimes this is where I play hide and seek, and the beans here, and the creek, which he hasn't colored up there. My favorite place is the barn and the cow lot, where he plays baseball and football. Okay, now, if that's the rural world of Jay, um, perhaps... Someone once said that the, the reason rural maps look the way they do, that is blank, something about the landscape, the blank stares of the people who, who make them. Um, but let's move. Oh, we missed one. Let's go back, please. Oh, the other way. Other way to the beginning. 
<laughs> there, yes, we got to go to New York. We're not going to Queens, but we're going to Archie Bunker's place, which is New York. And this is where um, Jennifer lives. She has a skyline, sense of historic presence, monuments, a people, perhaps uh, aristocracy. This is outside the Plaza Hotel, of course. Some of these older slides that are done in brown tin are from the National Archives. Um, and the park, a beautiful jewel set in the middle of the, of the city with long passageways. Romantic at night, great white way, dark, strangely beautiful. But there are other parts of this world, just as there are other parts of Jay's world. Here we have the tenements, overcrowding, poverty, hunger. Jacob Reese's photographs here of New York. And this is Jennifer's map. Jennifer is 10 years old and lives with her parents on the seventh floor of an expensive apartment building in the East 70s near Central Park. Um, her father is a banker who also owns a country house in Connecticut. And Jennifer spends most of her time in the apartment or the apartments of her friends. If you go back to that questionnaire, where do you and your friends play? I call up my friends and I either go to their apartment or they come to play in my department. Apartment. We play in the house. We don't play outside. There are no yards in New York, Mr. Trimmer. Don't you know that? Silly person. Um, she does, or has noticed, by the way, um, from the apartment of her friend across the street. Everybody refers to buildings in New York City by numbers, of course. This is 70, or this is 30, pardon me, and 31 is across the street, even on one side, out on the other. And when she was over at 31, she looked across and saw the tree. The only color in this whole world, by the way which you can make all kinds of interesting comments about. And I said, Jennifer, have you ever been up to see that tree? No. Why? New York statement. Somebody owns the roof. Um, notice, uh, by the way, that she also did not draw any windows above the seventh floor. Why, Jennifer? Because I don't know anybody above the seventh floor. I live on the seventh floor. That's where I, that's where I live. The only two windows that are distinguished in the whole building are this one, which is where her babysitter lives, and this one, which she notices when she walks home from school every day, or from the bus stop every day, uh, because there's a plant hanging in it. The other windows are interesting because of the bars, and this is where the doorman sits. I think it's, if I can read the detail on that. Um, whoop! Sorry. My mother drags me along with her shopping at Bloomingdale's or Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, the doorman sits at the window. Uh, we usually double park in front of the awning when we go away to the country. Um, now, the interesting thing about Jennifer is that while Jay um, walks to the corner to take a public bus to school, and while Jeff rides a bus, you know, an hour to school, public bus, there are two things that really interest me about Jennifer's world. One, Central Park is two blocks this way. I can go to the park, which is two blocks away, with my mother and father. Only with mother and father can she go and play in the park. Only with a parent. But even though she can walk, she can only walk two blocks this way with a parent. Every morning she walks three blocks this way, catches a bus, a public bus, not a school bus, you know, mass transit, which she takes by herself six blocks down here where she transfers and takes another block, a bus, another six or eight blocks to her private school. So she knows how to use the city and she just knows where her boundaries are. Um, okay, every morning she takes the bu private bus to school. Okay, she likes to travel and she's vacationed in many parts of America and many parts of the world. She likes to talk with her father about all his trips. In fact, they are moving to London very soon now where they will be living for the next few years. But when she, I asked her where she'd like to live of all the places she's been in the world, and she said, Florida. And I said, why? Because there are so many beautiful colors there. OK, that's the end of my children's maps. Uh, I'm going to look at three adult maps now. Um, now, these maps, you'll see two maps. That is, the adult draws his world at 10, and then he draws his world at 35. Each of these people has come from a different town to Muncie. 
In the first case, New Orleans to Muncie, a woman. Second case, Pittsburgh to Muncie. In the third case, uh, Pigot, Arkansas, by way of a lot of other places to Muncie. Um, the first maps are, look as you, um, I hope you will see the same thing I see. The first maps are much more detailed, much more vivid. The children's maps, that is, when they are 10. They are usually walking maps. They are always summer maps. They are intimate, personal. Things are named almost at every turn. The maps at 35 are driving maps. They are really station-to-station -station maps. Um, the seasons are indiscriminate. It could be any time. They are abstract, vague, and undetailed. And maybe that's because the world is no longer intimate for them, or since we live inside a car with air conditioning and radio and, and everything outside the car is like watching TV, the world is for us, not anything that's very interesting. Or maybe the world is just at 35 too complex for us to map. But in any event, I think you'll see a pattern between the two. Let's take Nedra first. Nedra grew up in New Orleans, and the water is extraordinarily important to her view of the world, her sense of the world, and also the intimacy of old neighborhoods, small houses, courtyards, and green. Green. And this is Nedra's map. Nedra grew up in New Orleans and remembers her neighborhood as tropical, intimate, and reassuring. I knew everybody and everybody's dog and cat, she said. She lived in the corner house, which meant she could often control the games on the block, such as running sandwich, a game where you start at one house with a piece of bread and run to each house, adding fixings until you get to the last piece of bread. Nedra remembers constantly being outside, cooking in the backyard or in the courtyard, talking over the fence, roller skating down the sidewalk to the nearby store. Nedra now lives in Muncie and feels strangely alien in this northern city. Instead of walking, or rather skating to the store, she drives several miles to the mall. This is her map now. She knows few of her neighbors and talks constantly of the advantages of life near the sea. Because of her husband's job, he's a teacher, Nedra will probably live most of her life in Muncie, but every vacation they drive home. And as soon as we pass Mobile, I can smell the salt air, she says. Then I know we're home. Uh, pretty blank world. Uh, our house, friends, mall, church, school. OK, next map is Steve, who grew up in Pittsburgh. An interesting city, ethnic diversity, hills, a skyline, a sports town. And this is Steve's map. And this is a walking map if I ever saw one, everywhere. Now, there are a lot of interesting things on this map. I can't point all of them out to you. but. This little symbol shows up several places. One, two, three, four. And that's the basketball hoop. And uh, this, this map is, a, is an epic odyssey in search of the ultimate basketball hoop. Steve's father was uh, uh, an assistant superintendent of schools and, and did not have enough money to purchase a basketball hoop. Or when he purchased one, it was so flappy that nobody really wanted to play with him at his court. So they would go everywhere. And this was the rich kids', rich kids uh, hoop, which was the ultimate place where they were occasionally invited to play. Uh, there are other things that are interesting here, although Steve, uh, Steve spent most of his time, although he was Protestant, at the Jewish Community Center, which had also a pretty good basketball hoop. But notice the amount of walking. All of these, these arrows are walking. Um, this is bus traffic, which he used extensively, too. But most of it is walking. Um, corner grocery store. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here that I can remember. Um, old folks, everything is named, the, the, the streets, the numbers on the street, and most of the neighbors you could remember. Now, <clears throat> compare that map with Steve's Muncie map. Now, he started out drawing, and it's about uh, eight-tenths of a mile from the ad building to home. From home to the end. He looked up at me and said, son of a bitch, I'm really in a rut, aren't I? I said, you sure are. Uh, now, you compare that to this world here, which is you know, so much more interesting. And I, I think it's walking that has a lot to do with it. But that world restricted and limited to this world. OK, now we'll have our last. Uh, Map, and this is George, I think my most 
my favorite, uh, Matt. George grew up in a place called Piggott, Arkansas. Um, actually, George grew up in a lot of places. His father was in the army in a, in a, in a chaplain, and so moved around an awful lot. <clears throat> but when Second World War came, they moved back to the family homestead you know, in Piggott, which uh, had a town square and uh, you know, bank and a little theater and a train which ran regularly on schedule and uh, the whittlers that sat around the courtyard square and uh, Saturday night on the town. And this is uh, George's map in Piggott. The thing that interested me about George is that they kept a map when, when George's father was away in World War II, uh, a big elaborate map like perhaps many families kept in World War II, and his, his father would send them coded letters, letters. They weren't allowed to tell where they were, but coded letters, and they would sit home every night when they got a letter and decode it and then move the little tack around on the map. So he knew where his father was, or, or thought he could in, in relation to that map, but here, here's where they lived. and. Uh, interesting things about the community, this town square, which we just saw, and this monument here, which actually George's uh, relatives pretty far back uh, helped erect. There are certain visible things here that he remembers, like uh, old Hilliard, Cousin Hilliard. I mean, we all have a Cousin Hilliard in our, in our family. Cousin Hilliard stepped off the curb when he was about six, uh, or maybe earlier, but he was in and out of the hospital a lot, and um, the, the mental hospital. and. Uh, Everybody sort of took care of old Hilliard. Every, every little town here takes care of their Hilliards, but he wasn't quite sure oh, pardon me, what Hilliard was, was up to half the time. Um, there was also um, Mrs. Hastings, who uh, is like many other people in our neighborhood, who was a neighborhood witch. Frightened all the kids, wouldn't let them play in their yard, her yard, and it was generally um, abusive to anybody who came near her, her, her sidewalk. Um, he remembers a lot of things uh, somewhere up in here, which probably, oh, here it is. Uh, he, he had 15 cents on Saturday night when he went into town. Five cents for the, to, to eat with and 10 cents to go to the theater, to the movies. And this is the depot and the train, which he remembers very vividly because, of course, uh, the train sort of organized their schedule during the day, particularly in the summers. And he remembers the rich kid's house, Pfeiffer's. There it is. Pfeiffer, the kid, possessed the best Lionel train set in six states, and he was the only kid, he was the only kid in the whole neighborhood who was ever invited up to see that train set up in the attic, and he was invited only once. So he had to repeat the story to all the other kids about what it was like. Very vivid world. Um, bullies at the ice house, um, cemetery, so forth. Now, let me tell you what happened about George. After George's father came back and and George graduated from high school. George uh, traveled around a lot himself, just like his father had. Went to college at University of Minnesota, and uh, went to law school in Minnesota, and then <clears throat> took his first job in Denver with a big firm right down there in the middle of town uh, with 100 other attorneys. <clears throat> and George was sitting there one Friday afternoon about 6.30, and uh, looked down the long hallway of offices and said to himself, I'm 30 now, and if I stay here another 30 years, probably what I'll have to show for it is I'll move four offices down this hall. Uh, a real sense of displacement and being claustrophobic in that place. So he decided he would go to work for a little corporation <clears throat> that uh, had a factory out in Boulder. You may know where the, the story is going now. He selected Denver. I, I, the, the, as usual, my storytelling is getting ahead of itself. The key decision. When he left law school, he decided of all the places he'd seen all across the United States, and he'd seen many of them, San Francisco and Seattle and Washington, D.C. and New York and all of them, the place that he thought was the most beautiful and had the greatest uh, potential for quality of life was Denver. So that's why he, he went there. Now, as I said, he decided after that little moment of angst in the in the office uh, in downtown Denver that he would go to work for a little corporation out in Boulder. <clears throat> that was a good move. But George made one bad mistake. George did his job so well that that little corporation in Boulder transferred him to international headquarters, Muncie. <laughs> Ball Corporation. Okay, 
So now George, after all of that traveling all across the country and all of those choices of ideal environments, winds up here. And uh, this is what he sees, Muncie. Now I'm showing you green scenes for a particular reason. This is George's map of Muncie. Now, <clears throat> George is down in Ball Corporation and his office, that little X right there, is on the northwest corner. When they were sorting out and selecting offices in the new building, George insisted on the northwest corner. Why? Because he could see from his windows the only parts of Muncie that he would tolerate. The green worlds of Ball State, his friends, Catalina Swimming Club, the tennis club, Escape, airport. And I asked him, what about the rest of Muncie? And he literally drew lines. I don't want to see any of this. <laughs> Well, um, as we ponder, as we ponder the significance and meaning of George's map, uh, I want to end with a little story. Um, this story uh, really comes from a piece of crosswork stitching that my mother did. It was a little sampler that she hung in the front hall of our home, and our home changed a lot. We lived in a lot of different places, but that little sampler went everywhere with us. And I guess what the sampler tells us, and I'll go through it in a second, what that sampler tells us is that that place is really a function of the imagination. And that's why I guess people in literature are so interested in it. It's not something that just happens. It's, it's a creative relationship between a person and an environment. And we're going to have to work on George. Um, but that little sampler said, travel east. Travel west, after all, home is best. And this is what I want to show George. This is Shangri-La right here, baby. Thank you very much. <laughs>